I, I was thinking about it uh, a little before um, in talking with Ryan, and I, and I guess most of the things that I have to say um, seem uh, kind of obvious, um, but I will I'll say them anyway. Um, and I'll talk a bit about uh, the process of writing a proposal for um, the Marshall and the Rhodes, um, and then talk a little bit about preparing for the interview um, for the Marshall and the Rhodes. Um, on the proposal, you know, I think um, Kelly touched on this a little bit, but I, I think um, there are sort of two questions um, at the heart of the matter. And um, one of them is, is, I think, the sort of threshold question that all of the scholarship committees will ask of applicants, um, which is, uh, are you the person that, uh, for whom this scholarship or this fellowship would be most useful? Um, is your proposal one uh, that would truly take advantage of the resources um, that are up for grabs? Uh, are you someone that would really go on and do interesting things with uh, with those resources and so forth. Um, I think that's one of the, the two questions uh, to keep in mind, and I think it's a question that, that every member of every interview committee uh, asks of the applicant. Um, the, other, the other question I think is a little bit, sorry, I just, I in the, way. Um, the, the other question is, is a little complicated, and I think, I think people um, maybe disagree about um, what follows from it, but there's, I think there's some, kind of confusion and maybe some tension with all of these fellowships about whether or not, uh, in a way, they're supposed to be forward-looking or backward-looking. Um, and what I mean by that is it's, it's not clear to me, even now, um, whether the, the Rhodes people and the Marshall people conceive of these things as rewards for doing all sorts of interesting things in college, um, or, as, uh, or as resources that will allow you to do interesting things that you haven't yet done. Um, and, I, and I think the answer, and to some extent it's a cop-out, is, uh, is both. Um, to some extent, they, they are rewards for doing interesting things with yourself in college. Uh, and, and to some extent, um, they are also providing you with an opportunity to do things and complete yourself uh, and do various uh, interesting educational projects that you haven't had a chance to do in college. Um, and I, I want to take that as a way to kind of talk about the differences between uh, writing a proposal for the roads and writing a proposal for the Marshall. I, I, I will assume you guys know a little bit about them, but I'll say some about the two scholarships. They're both two-year scholarships for graduate study in England, um, and the main difference between them is, is the Rhodes is uh, for two years of study at Oxford, and the Marshall is, um, is for two years of study uh, at any university in the UK or any combination of universities in the UK. So some people, in other words, will do two-year programs at Oxford or Cambridge or LSE, and other people will do uh, a combination of two one-year programs at a variety of schools. Uh, two schools. Um, and I, uh, I really disliked applying for the Rhodes Scholarship in many ways. Um, you know, to some extent it was fun, um, but to some extent it's, it's also an extremely constraining process um, because you're confined to Oxford. Um, and one of the things that I, that I really enjoyed about applying for the Marshall Scholarship is I, is I felt it was much easier um, to, to be a bit flexible with it. And um, the proposal that I wrote for the Rhodes, I wrote two different proposals actually. The first one was um, to study political philosophy, and the second one was to study comparative government and economics. Um, and the proposal that I wrote for the Marshall was to do two masters, um, one of which was in journalism and one of which um, is in economics. And uh, I just had a much better time with the Marshall proposal. Um, you know, the main reason is I had done a lot of journalism stuff in college. Um, I was working at the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, I had taken a year off and I had worked for a British newspaper. And I kind of felt like um, when I was writing this proposal, I could really sell a lot of my, my past accomplishments as, as tying in with, with journalism. Um, as at least one of you knows uh, from being in a class with me, I was a terrible economics student here. Um, I, it was not my major. Uh, but, I, but I sort of felt like that was perfectly okay, and, and it was okay to write about these things in my application and say, um, even though I'm not the greatest of economics students, uh, this is something I would really like to do in, in graduate school. Um, and, and I think that actually made for a better application. To some extent, I, I think it was, it was better to be able to say, 
Um, part of what I want to do here is explore things that I've already done a lot with in college, and part of what I want to do is, is really kind of go out on a limb and, and do something uh, quite different. And I, I think that, that is one thing um, to keep in mind. A couple of other things about the proposal um, that occurred to me. One is, uh, you know, Kelly mentioned some of this, but I, but I do think it is important um, when you're writing your essay and when you're um, filling in the various boxes on, on the application form, um, try and sort of point things in the same direction. Um, try and come up with, with a fairly clear narrative about yourself uh, for why uh, the things you've done in the past and the interests you have for the future really do sort of point themselves collectively towards the particular goal that you have uh, in the application. Um, the, the third point that I wanted to try and make is that I, I do think it pays to, to come up with something unique. Um, you know, for the roads, to some extent, I, I know they get a huge number of people that apply uh, to do masters in development, um, and I, I know that they, uh, they really like to see kind of different things um, from their applicants. Uh, for the Marshall in particular, uh, I, think, I think it sometimes offends them when they see um, people do the same application for the, for the roads and the Marshall. Um, they like to see people apply to places besides uh, Oxford, Cambridge, or the London School of Economics. Um, I, would, I would really spend a lot of time uh, digging through Wikipedia even, uh, websites about particular schools, particular professors at programs. Um, really gather as much information as you can uh, about the proposal that you're interested in. Uh, and I, I really think it'll make for a better application. I think when you can include details about particular professors at a program, it's extremely helpful. When you can tie in things that you've done to particular details about the program, it's also um, pretty helpful. And I, I also think, you know, for the for the um, the boards of, of selection themselves, uh, they really like to have a group of people that are doing a unique set of things um, with the opportunity. Uh, the, the last thing that occurred to me was. Um, I would I would sort of avoid trying to make the application as a whole sort of like a list of accomplishments. I mean, I guess this was something that, that occurred to me between the two years of applying. Um, I think the first year I I um, I kind of went about the process in a in a very sort of mechanical way, and I and I kind of thought um, it would be good to have you know the highest possible GPA and to list you know every single award I've gotten um, since kindergarten or whatever. Um, and, and I think that's, that's actually a terrible strategy, and I, and I would say um, it's really good to, to be able to write on your proposal, um, I suck at X, um, I, I really want to improve myself, uh, I've never been able to learn a language, um, you know, something like that I, I think is perfectly acceptable, uh, and, and I, actually, I actually think they get a kick out of reading things like that, because, you know, for the, for the most part, a lot of the applicants um, are, are long lists of accomplishments. Um, and I think it is it is healthy to be something other than that. Um, I, I will now sort of awkwardly shift gears and talk about the interview process. Um, both both the Rhodes and the Marshall uh, have board interviews. Um, the the Rhodes is is sort of uniquely miserable because in addition to the interview around the, the like board table, there's also um, a cocktail party the night before. Which is, which, is like, which is like not an interview, they say, and like just relax and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's like also an interview and you know, you're, you're supposed to like show off your social skills and it's really uncomfortable for everyone. <laughs> um, and and there, I mean, there are all sorts of you know, horror stories about this. And uh, I think this is, this is maybe where the stuff about being a star athlete comes up. I, um, I, did, I had this, this, this guy on the Rhodes interview, he was like, um, it was like in maybe 70, 75 or something like that. Uh, and this story doesn't have a particularly happy conclusion, but he, you know, he was like the only graduate in the history of West Point to have been president of his class, uh, had the highest GPA, was captain of the football team, won the Heisman Trophy, and won the Rhodes Trophy. I mean, it's just sort of astonishing. And I'd written something on my application about, about skateboarding a lot, and um, he sort of came up to me and he, and he said, he said, young man, uh, do you really think skateboarding satisfies the criteria of Cecil Rhodes' will? Um, it, was, it was sort of... Uh, I said, I, said I, I didn't think it did. Um, uh, that, 
that said, I, you know, I think I think there are a couple things. I, you know, I, you can't prepare for a situation like that, but there are certainly things you can do to prepare for an interview uh, for the scholarship. And um, somewhere on my sheets of paper, I wrote down some of them. Um, the, I think the single most important thing to do, uh, and you know, this probably applies to anything, and maybe it's just extremely obvious, but it's certainly certainly applied to uh, the three interviews that I did. Is um, I think what really pays, you know, more than trying to learn every single fact about the world, um, or more than even trying to calm yourself down before the interview, is just to go over your application again and again and again, um, and really know it through and through, and have something to say about about every syllable in there. Um, you know, really to a, to a sort of granular level of detail, be able to comment uh, in quite a deep way on everything you've written. If you've got an offhand allusion to like Proust or something, I'm not that anyone should ever do that, but if, if you have that, you know, be able, to, be able to say some stuff about Proust in the interview. Um, if, you've, if you've just mentioned um, your time studying abroad, be able to talk for five, six, seven minutes about studying abroad. Um, be able to talk about everything. Really, really understand and, and kind of think about what you've written. Uh, because for the most part, I think all of the questions you'll get in an interview are gonna have to do with that application. They're not gonna be for the most part, out of the dark questions about the financial crisis or whatever. And you know, there's, there's gonna be so much kind of contradictory advice you'll get about this, and people will say, you know, you need to be reading a newspaper every day you know, for two weeks before the interview. I, you can do that if you want. I, I really, that, that was not helpful for me. Uh, I think it will, it will accomplish very little except to make you more stressed out about the experience. Um, the, the biggest and most helpful thing that I think you can do is to go over your application and really be able to talk about every every piece of it. Um, if there's one other piece of advice, and I think this is probably even more vague and, and perhaps even more obvious than the first one, is uh, don't don't think about the interview as an adversarial process. Think about it as a conversation. And to the extent possible, I think I think it is better to shift it onto conversational grounds. And if you can give answers to questions that um, that will that will produce follow-up questions and produce thought and further conversation. I think that's the way to go. You know, don't don't think about yourself as trying to close off various avenues of attack. Um, you can open yourself up in various ways. Uh, you can you can profess ignorance. You can profess ignorance and then say, um, but here's how I'd go uh, go about trying to take a stab at answering that. Uh, I I really do think people in the interview appreciate that not only because it it'll make you appear or or make you seem accurately more thoughtful than other candidates, but, um, uh, but, but I think it'll, it'll set them at ease as well. And I think when, uh, when they're more comfortable and more enjoying the situation, uh, the outcome will be better. Uh, I suspect I've talked for more than 10 minutes, so I will stop.